the person who is cultivating a certain relationship of heartfulness inside of themselves and how it is that when people come into contact with this human being who has been training, right, with yoga and meditation, it's this relational aspect of mindfulness and yoga that can be so deeply transformative. How hearts are meeting with one another. Hello, and welcome to the Meta Hour podcast with Sharon Salzberg. I'm Lily Cushman, and I produce this wonderful podcast. And today we are returning to our mental health series, long awaited. We started this in the spring of this year, 2023. This is a series that Sharon began initially as part of the Mental Health Awareness Month. And it's been such a rich topic that we've decided to continue it with really a whole wide range of different guests to speak on the different aspects of mental health and also how the tools of Buddhism or spiritual practice can be applied toward mental well being. So, for today, episode 223, we're thrilled to have Dr. Sarah King. Sarah, if you don't know her work, she is a neuroscientist, a political and learning scientist, education philosopher, entrepreneur, public speaker. She also teaches yoga and mindfulness. You may recognize her because she has recently joined the Open Your Heart in Paradise retreats as a part of the Ramdas legacy, both in Maui and in Boone. And so she's bringing some really incredible wisdom to our mental health series, a lot of which is the kind of behind the scenes information about neuroplasticity and really the hope that neuroplasticity offers us, how well-being is understood in neuroscience and how that applies to mental health. Sarah is also deeply involved in social justice and so there's some conversation today about how that correlates to mental health and neuroscience. Also growth versus fixed mindset and the role of pain in mental health. A tool that Sarah has developed over the years is something called a systems-based awareness map, which is a, a fascinating way to understand the human experience. And I think you'll find this conversation also quite personal. Sarah sharing her personal story, how she came to her path, how her history has shaped her path, and the work of post-traumatic growth. So before we get to today's episode, a couple of quick announcements. The first is just that we are running an ongoing list of mental health resources as part of this series, and I invite you to check out our show notes for today's episode to find those. We're asking each of our guests in the series to give us a few of their recommendations and also Sharon's recommendations. So it's a growing list, and I recommend you take a peek at it. The other news of note is that Sharon is offering a five-day loving-kindness challenge starting September 13th, which is right around the corner. And this is something that evolved out of her book, Real Life, which came out in the spring of this year, 2023. And as Sharon describes it in her process of writing that book, she really came to some different understandings about the application of loving kindness. And so we decided to put together this challenge as a way to offer those new understandings, new applications. So this is five days, about 
20 to 25 minutes per lesson. You get a teaching, a meditation practice, a life practice, and some different reflections. As always, we are offering this on a sliding scale basis so that finances are not a barrier for you to participate. And so if you're someone who is dabbled in loving kindness or looking for some new applications, this is a wonderful offering for you. And it's also a fun one to do with a friend. So if you're not sure about doing it on your own, we have a lot of folks who will sign up either as a small group or with a buddy and you can go through the lessons together. One last thing I will mention is there are lots of people, I don't know if that might be you, who are very busy and you can also do this challenge at your own pace. So you'll have lifetime access to the materials and you can consume them any way you want. So please join us. You can visit SharonSalzberg.com to sign up. And it's called the Emerging Into Connection Challenge. Okay, so let's get to today's episode. Dr. Sarah King and Sharon Salzberg. Hello, Sarah. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Sharon. Oh, it's a great delight. Where are you recording from today? Uh, I am recording from San Francisco or Ohlone Land in California. Uh-huh. Well, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, and today's episode is part of what uh, we're calling the Mental Health Series. I, like so many of us, you know, meet so many people who are struggling. Um, This has been a really outrageous period in many people's lives, one Mm -hmm. way or another. And uh, it's been really hard for a lot of people. And uh, emergence is also very hard for a lot of people. And so um, there are also, you know, bodies of knowledge and uh, experimental approaches and and people, I think, fundamentally, who are not afraid to talk about the places the mind can go and mm-hmm. and ways that we can actually uh, work with some of those places. And so um, that's sort of the nature of, of the series. And for those listening, why don't we start with a little bit about your path and how you came to this melding of what's often thought to be very different fields of neuroscience and social justice and art and (laughs) mindfulness. Oh, yeah. Um, Well, you know, Sharon, I am incredibly heartened to say um, that in my personal experience, this idea that uh, somehow neuroscience and and social justice are separate, um, I I, I think that that idea is... uh, really doesn't hold as much ground as it used to before. And I think that um, that, is in, that is the case in part because of, you know, the extraordinary uh, expansion um, of, of awareness around social justice that occurred during the pandemic um, with the movement for racial justice uh, that was... Um, so deeply uh, inspired and propelled forth by the death of our brother, George Floyd. So, um, you know, I think that uh, a lot of, in my experience, a lot of people within the neuroscience community, but also within the scientific community more broadly, uh, began to develop something of a critical consciousness around social justice in the same way that Uh, people, humans across all sectors were um, beginning to really uh, develop their thinking. Um, But, you know, for myself, I would say that my roots of um, thinking about and situating myself in social justice really came from my family uh, and from my ancestors. Uh, So, 
you know, as a human being, I uh, ancestrally, I'm of West African descent. I'm of uh, Onondaga Native American descent, as well as uh, a variety, a smattering of of different um, uh, European populations. But really, I think, you know, this is just another way of describing what we tend to call or refer to the identity of an African-American, right? Mm -hmm. African-Americans um, are truly an amalgam um, in terms of our uh, ethnic background in this country. And my mother in particular, um, as well as really on my mother's side, all of my aunts and my uncles and my grandparents were heavily involved in the civil rights movement. So when I was a little girl and, you know, my mother would be telling me bedtime stories, she would be talking to me about, um, you know, her involvement in groups like CORE and SNCC and, you know, um, you know, being at meetings and hanging out with Angela Davis and, um, you know, just the ways in which her consciousness as a Black woman um, growing up in Pennsylvania, but really having a lot of family members in Virginia in the Jim Crow South and how that experience of the terror of segregation, um, the terror of experiencing living in a society where she was othered to the point where, you know, it was a, um, it was a violent experience just navigating the world in the body that she was in. I think that that, um, really shaped um, my feelings of compassion. Mm -hmm. um, I I was very um, aware of when my mother encountered racism um, in her daily life as a child. I was I think I was a very empathetic child, and I could feel the vibration of that pain of othering in her nervous system. I could feel the grief of it. And I, I wanted to do something about that. And I, uh, I really carried uh, that impetus, that, that desire to want to offer my mother, but as well um, members of uh, my community to offer them healing. I carried it clear through my career and I, I recall when I first started at UCLA, um, it was the beginning of a 10-year grad school journey there, learning that at the time, schools were just as segregated, if not more so, in the United States mm -hmm. than they were in the 1970s. And I thought, well, what does that mean emotionally? What are the emotional qualities of the heart? You know, when we're talking about hatred or the experience of ignorance um, that still persists so deeply that children are not able to recognize one another in themselves. And, uh, you know, initially I thought, well, maybe it has to do something with the curriculum, you know, what they're being taught, cognitively speaking. But I think it was through my personal longtime practice of yoga and meditation that I realized that education and learning do not just occur cognitively education and learning can be embodied, can transform our relationship to our nervous systems and thus uh, transform our neural wiring. And that was when I really started to ask myself, well, what kinds of curriculums currently exist in the United States schooling system that are actually attempting to bring about this, if you will, inner education. Um, and that really transformed the entire trajectory of my research in the direction of examining yoga and meditation interventions inside of schools and um, 
you know, I would say to keep a <laughs> to keep a very long story short, mm-hmm. the 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 students that I was working with in my dissertation research, they were a brilliant group of 12-year-olds, right? And they were all youth of color. And um, you know, they lived in a neighborhood where their experience of violence, psychological violence, mental health issues, homelessness, um, neglect, drug abuse was very chronic. They were very aware of how systemic oppression directly contributed to these phenomena in their communities. And I like to tell this story often. I, I mean, because it, it it just never ceases to amaze me the day that these students, a group of these students who are receiving this yoga and meditation intervention decided to band together and march through the hallways. And they were, mm-hmm. they had a petition that they were asking other students to sign to kick the intervention out of the school. They mutinied, right? They organized, they self-organized. And I thought, well, okay, where, where is the wisdom here? As a research scientist, I was very curious. I wanted to know why. And they told me that, um, they weren't learning in the context of this mindfulness and yoga intervention how to think critically or to develop language or practices that helped them to more deeply understand their identities in relationship to the systemic Mm -hmm. oppression that they were facing and how to not only heal themselves, but to take that healing and be agentive to do something about what was happening in their communities. And that was really the first time that I put, began to put the pieces of neuroscience, right? And how it is that mindfulness and yoga practices can uh, transform the nervous system and the the mind-body connection and social justice. Wow. (laughs) Uh, So my mind's gone in lots of different directions. So I'm going to (laughs) corral it in some way or another. Um, One is uh, I'm old enough um, so that I remember when uh, the whole concept of neuroplasticity um, didn't exist. Mm. And that people, you know, the belief was like I learned in science class, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, that uh, if you got to be a certain age, I guess in your mid-20s or something like that. Yeah. And um, you, unless, you, you know, if you had some terrible accident, some trauma, then your your brain could degenerate, but it was not going to regenerate, that there was not going to be positive change. Right, right. Um, too late, you know. <laughs> and so it was only like much later in my life that this concept of neuroplasticity came about. And I'm wondering if, if part of your training as a neuroscientist actually gave you more hope oh. for change and possibility. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Ten thousand percent, and you know, I I recall um, in graduate school when I first came, when I was looking into um, the field of well-being research, because neuroscience as a field is so vast, right? And so I was really examining just this one little sliver of neuroscience research as pertains to um, well-being and embodiment, and um, within the medical field, well-being is considered to be what's called a biopsychosocial phenomenon. What does this big word mean, right? Essentially, it means that well-being is always occurring on three different levels. It's occurring for us physiologically, right? And this is where Physiological measurements of well-being, like fMRIs, um, are are commonly used within the realm of neuroscience. It's occurring psychologically, right? And this ties into our 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 topic um, around mental health. 
But very importantly, and I think that this was very central to the results of my dissertation, well-being is relational. That's the social part of biopsychosocial. Mm -hmm. And so where this gave me hope is I realized that when we talk about mindfulness and yoga, right, in the scientific literature, there can sometimes be this sense that like mindfulness and yoga are somehow having these effects on their own, but that strips them away from the human being, from the person, mm -hmm. the person who is cultivating a certain relationship of heartfulness inside of themselves and how it is that when people come into contact with this human being who has been training, right, with yoga and meditation, it's this relational aspect of mindfulness and yoga that can be so deeply transformative, how hearts are meeting with one another. And that was in part what motivated me to really um, look at this term social justice mm -hmm. and break it down in a little bit of a, of a, of a different way, in a, in a little bit of an unexpected way, I think in my field. So when I say social justice, I look at this word social and I oftentimes think about the way that Thich Nhat Hanh spoke of interbeing, right? And the importance of this, this real felt sense of our interdependence with one another. But then when I am talking about, when I use this word justice, right? What, is, what does the justice part mean in social justice in my research framing? I'm not talking about law and order, mm -hmm. okay? I'm, I'm not talking about um, the ways in which we punish or penalize one another for behaviors that we um, perceive to be uh, wayward or harmful. When I use this term justice, I define it very specifically as loving awareness in action. loving awareness and action. And I think that that is so important because then when we are in the realm of our relationships, um, when we're navigating in our communities and when we know that injustice is present, right? Well, how do we know that injustice is present? We know that because of the violence that we feel in the context mm -hmm. of our relationships whether that's psychological or, or physical violence. And we can also know in my theory that justice is present when loving awareness is present inside of ourselves and our relationships. And this gives me absolutely no end of hope because I know that the possibility of cultivating loving awareness is so accessible to all of us, no matter where we come from in life. Well, that's beautiful. Because, like, you know, I was thinking on the one hand, it could seem like the study of the brain, and that's also an interesting question. The brain, the mind, are they different? Are they the same? <laughs> um, you know, it can yeah. seem reductionistic, but yeah, I yeah. find it gives me hope. I'm, I'm not, I'm far from a neuroscientist, but just a little bit, you know, that I've, I've been exposed to, and especially, of course, around the studies around meditation and, um, you know, in, in the sense that, uh, you know, I guess one way of describing is through Carol Dweck's work with the difference between a growth mindset and a set kind of mm -hmm. mindset. You know, you're either born with certain characteristics, and I would think for certain kinds of people for whom the story of who they are is usually told by others. Yes. You know, and sort of put upon them. Yes. It's even stronger. Like, this is who I am and it's this limitation. And yes. It's done, you know, compared to a growth mindset, mm -hmm. which is, you know, this is my, you know, chief quality right now, but anything can change. Mm. And, you know, there's possibility. I don't know exactly how or when, but 
Yeah. Let me embark on that journey, you know? Yes, absolutely. This is the kind of uh, flexibility and adaptability um, that I think is so key to the cultivation of resilience, especially during these incredibly challenging times. And I was, um, you know, one, one idea or theory that I have been um, very interested in within the field of neuroscience research, looking at experiences of pain. Mm-hmm. And pain is also a biopsychosocial phenomenon, right? We can have pain that we're experiencing physiologically in our bodies, but it is also experienced mentally. It's also experienced Mm -hmm. socially. And one thing that I think is an interesting possibility to explore in neuroscience is this idea that we all have identities, right? And our identities are very complex and they're always changing and shifting and growing over time as we're encountering new people and ideas and environments. But um, there can be at times aspects of our identity that we don't necessarily give ourselves. Sometimes there are aspects of our identity. And as you're saying, right, stories that are told about us that are applied to us. We are told, Mm -hmm. no, Mm -hmm. you look like this. You come from this place, this zip code or whatever. You're this background, you're this. And it's it's forced upon us Mm -hmm. without consent. And sometimes that act of having some aspect of our identity forced upon us I theorize can be quite painful Mm -hmm. because it can rob us of our feelings of agency and choice in that moment to not only to define for ourselves who we are in any given moment, but also to be free of the rigidity that can around identity and an Mm -hmm. inability to adapt and be flexible that I think can also generate a lot of pain, but also Mm -hmm. disconnection from ourselves and from others who may not necessarily share in that particular type of identity. Well, it's terrible disconnection because how often are we accurately seen anyway, you know? Right, right. And there's just this massive story about who we are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that um, part to me, and maybe this is, you know, I like to say a lot of the time, you know, sometimes I'm speaking with my scientist cap on and other times it's, I'm just speaking as Syrah. So here just Mm -hmm. me, you know, speaking as Syrah, I think that um, part of the reason why we are experiencing such an acute mental health crisis right now Um, And the U.S. Surgeon General um, has uh, named mental health, the mental health crisis, as the crisis of our time, especially Mm -hmm. amongst adolescents. And why is that? Um, I think in part it is because we exist in a world that Um, doesn't oftentimes give us the resources that we need, the space, the time, the places, the relationships that can allow us to practice resting in our own being Mm -hmm. and meeting with our own being with qualities of loving kindness and forgiveness and compassion that can open up the opportunity to peel some of those layers back and meet with our authentic selves. And so, you know, in part, I think that's why there is um, so much conversation happening about the role of social media and other forms of technology in Mm -hmm. fragmenting our sense of self and our relationship with ourselves and one another because 
I think that we all know to a certain extent that what's being mirrored back to us in these images isn't in any, to any extent, who we fully are. And, and that causes pain. It causes crisis. Well, there's so many things, you know, from the kind of meditative world too that, um, you know, may not be available tools or, or very um, much understood tools. But when you, when you talk about pain, you know, it's interesting, like within mindfulness, uh, looking at physical pain is often a template for emotional pain. Mm-hmm. Is it some of the same skills and some of the same issues? It's like things really hurt. They do. That's genuine and it's, um, it's happening. But yeah. on yeah. top of that, of course, uh, they're just the add-ons we might uh, put on just from force of habit. Like I'm the only one who ever feels this or yes. this is the only thing I will ever feel. It's here forever. Oh, yeah. And uh, it just makes things so much worse. And what's so interesting to me about your work is that um, often for the people who hear about mindfulness, who are have a strong social justice orientation, it sounds like, well, you're not going to try to do anything about uh-huh. Situation, you know, or the circumstance. Yes. And you're gonna give people more inner strength, which is nice, you know, but uh-huh. it's so uh not enough. And and it never occurred to me that it really meant you were never gonna do anything about anything, you know, but <laughs> yeah. more like um why engage, you know, for maximum depletion uh-huh. and exhaustion and overwhelm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I uh I recall um you know when I was doing my postdoctoral work in neurology at Oregon Health Science University in Portland, I was doing a a radio interview um about my work in the in the mindfulness space. And uh somebody called in and you know they said something like well, you know, you say that your work is all about this intersection between neuroscience and mindfulness and social justice, but it sounds to me like what you're doing is you are placing the onus and the responsibility of healing on the individual. You're mm-hmm. you're almost in some ways saying to the individual, well, if you're not healed already, that's your fault. And they also felt that, um, you know, within the mindfulness field, this this whole narrative around acceptance Mm -hmm. suggests that what we're trying to say is is just, um, you know, almost like, yes, tend to yourself selfishly and Mm -hmm. your own feelings and, and emotional states, but give up on action. And I was glad that that person called in um, because it offered me an opportunity to present what I hoped would be a counter narrative. Um, And I know that there are many scholars who have written on topics like engaged Buddhism Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just, you know, what it means to, to actually be engaged in the world in the context of being a mindfulness practitioner. And one thing that I really love to emphasize is that in the work of social justice, right, oftentimes it's painful work because you're going about the business of identifying what is painful, right? Who is experiencing lack? Who doesn't have what they need? Um, who is experiencing violence inside of their communities and how is this violence rooted in um, longstanding histories of um, various types of institutions that have been established in part to ensure that people who look like them or live in that area continue to be without access to the resources that they need to experience a quality of life um, 
that is good, that is rich, that is full of aliveness, right? It's painful work. And I think that, you know, within neuroscience uh, and the study of well-being, there is a lot of research looking at stress, right? The stress response Mm -hmm. um, and how that is hardwired into our brains. And when we are in a situation uh, such as perhaps social justice work, and we are encountering a lot of stressful situations, and I would say that's probably because we feel a lot of compassion for the pain and the lack that we see in society, that can really result in chronic pain Mm -hmm. and chronic stress, which can fundamentally begin to alter the neural wiring of the brain such that we're now living with hypervigilance and we can begin to experience a whole myriad of health issues with everything ranging from, you know, insomnia to heart problems and asthma and, um, you know, or, or when we're talking about mental health, it can really begin to contribute um, to depression and anxiety, right? To just name a few of the ways in which this pain can manifest in our bodies. (coughs) And so to me, a mindfulness practice and especially a mindfulness practice that is grounded in an exploration, a compassionate exploration of identity. So a mindfulness practice that is um, compassionately grounded in an exploration of identity and relationship can be very helpful in the context of social justice work because it can provide a hopefully safe space for us to begin to notice when we are habitually dropping into reactivity. And when we are dropping into emotional reactivity, what that means on a nervous system level, we're talking about emotions, we're talking about arousal here, the activation of the autonomic nervous system, Mm -hmm. right? And autonomic, we can think of as, it's automatic, right? It's it's Mm -hmm. really um, below the experience of our consciousness. We can begin to habitually slip into uh, emotional responses that are um, coming from a place of fight or flight um, or even freeze or appease. And this is what is called the activation of the body's trauma response, right? Mm-hmm. And when we're in relationship with others and we're seeking to do this social justice work, which to me really is the work of how we heal ourselves and our communities, and we're in this emotional reactivity, then we can be so involved in trying to make our point, trying to be right, um, becoming argumentative, um, trying to fight one another, um, that the environment in which we are trying to do this social justice work really suddenly can become one that is not necessarily conducive to loving relationships. Mm -hmm. And in my personal opinion, the work of social justice is about love and it's about healing. So if love is not present, or or rather if, if we're in so much of a state of reactivity that it becomes challenging to express love to ourselves and one another, I think that makes the work of social justice much more difficult. So in that a mindfulness practice can help us to reconnect with loving kindness and compassion in the Mm -hmm. middle of a conversation. 
I think it really does have the potential to be a part of the the relational fabric of love that we need to move this work forward. That's great. Can you um, also explain what you mean by a systems-based awareness map? (laughs) Of course, of course, of course. Um, So my systems-based awareness map really comes out of my research with the science of social justice. That's the name of my research framework. And, um, you know, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I don't know that I've actually told the story of when I created the map. So the map is a visual exploration of uh, all of the many layers of our internal experience, right? So it really um, starts in the center with what Dan Siegel has called the plane of possibility. Um, this space where, you know, really the potential of anything that you could possibly imagine could emerge from. Um, we might even call it the quantum space, the space from which dreams and imagination are coming from. And it moves from there to an exploration of our capacity to be internally aware what is happening inside of ourselves. It's so complex, right? So it's exploring memories, emotions, feelings, sensations, and thoughts. And then it moves from there into a layer that I call identity awareness, right? So where are we experiencing identity other than inside of our bodies? Identity is an embodied experience. And I like to say that identity is always intergenerational, right? So it's about this relationship between our ancestors and our descendants. Um, It's epigenetic. So it is about the relationship between the environment that we grew up in and how that impacts our gene expression. And it's also intersectional, right? So meaning that all the different facets of our identity, whether that's race or gender or sexuality or what have you, are constantly meeting with one another and informing each other, right? All of the complexity of that, including our internal experience of vitality or disease, we, our brains, are mapping this out for us every single moment of the day inside of our bodies, whether we are completely still, like in a meditation practice, or whether we are enacting ourselves upon the world. So the next layer of the map is about really um, tracking our, our behavior, our speech, our relationships, our agency, how we in bodies have an effect upon the world. And then very lastly, and I'm, I'm describing to you right now this two-dimensional map, which is um, it's available mm-hmm. online for those who are actually interested in seeing the image. The very mm-hmm. last layer of the map is about um, how humans are fundamentally connected through our actions and our behaviors to our environment, society, and culture. So I devised this map because I thought that um, I really needed an an image, a visual um, that would allow myself as well as others to really see that all of the phenomena that we experience inside of our bodies that we're internally aware of, as well as everything that we experience as outside of us, right, in the external environment, they all map onto each other and they are all deeply impacted by our experience of well-being or trauma. Mm -hmm. And so with this visualization, we can also see that through contemplative practices, we can begin to shift our awareness of what's happening inside of us. And that will also impact our awareness of the world that we are situated in such that we can begin to contemplate the kinds of actions that would 
contribute to collective health and well-being. Mm -hmm. And that's really what the map is about. That's great. Well, so many different um, memories and, and things I'd experienced or thoughts came up for me. So I'll, I'll mm -hmm. kind of lay them out for you and you can tell me. Yes. Uh, yeah. If if they are relevant to that, to that looking at the map. So one is, um, I've often said, as as I think is really true, that uh, learning to think in a sort of systems way is a whole education. Mm -hmm. You know, it isn't necessarily going to come bundled with mindfulness or loving kindness <laughs> practice, but right, it's it's a whole education and. I think of, you know, the many, many people I've taught who may come up to me later and say, you know, um, something like I, uh, you know, I was walking down the street. I was approached by somebody asking for a dollar. Um, I gave them a dollar because that is my habit. But this was the first time I ever looked him in the eye and realized this is a human being. Mm. He's out on the street. And that's sort of the beauty of becoming more aware. Um, and yet, I don't know how many of those people then go on to think, I wonder what the housing policy is in this city. Mm -hmm. So that there's so many people out on the street. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I, I do have often thought of it as kind of a, a separate endeavor that really needs to happen for the kind of collective change you're talking about. I also thought of... Um, times when um, we've been reminded, you know, or I've been reminded to look more deeply in a sense, look for causes and conditions, because if you're trying to resolve something, um, you won't see them all. You won't even mm -hmm. maybe want to go to the very, very, very depth, which could be ignorance, you know? Right, right. But uh, like I think of this um, Thai activist, uh, Sulak Shivaraksha, who came to visit us. He just said something like, if you want to resolve the issue of sex trafficking of children in Thailand, he said, look at their agricultural policy. Mm. You know, he said, there's a reason those farmers are selling their children. Mm. Um, things like that, you know, like look mm -hmm. deeper. Yeah. And uh, there's something about remembering causes and conditions. And, and the, other, the last thing I'll say was there's something about it that also I think relieves us of the sometimes excessive burden of feeling it's all up to us to resolve with our shift in attitude or something like that. So, yeah. well, I never want to um, decry or put down the power of one's mind. Um, you know, there are kind of some prevalent thoughts that, uh, you know, you caused your cancer, for example, by wrong thinking. And mm. if only you'd had you know, a, a clearer, better, more enlightened way of thinking, you wouldn't have cancer. My response is usually, I really honor the power of the mind, but if you live near a toxic waste dump, you might look at that too. That's right. You know, right. and like causality is so complex. It's so intricate. There are so many systems involved that we need to do what we can. I really do believe that, obviously. You know, it's my life's work in terms of, the power of our own minds and what we can uh, articulate and what we can harness, but at the same time, look more deeply, you know, look broader mm -hmm. in a way. Yes. Um, because there's so many systems at play here that if you are blaming yourself or considering it only up to you, yes. uh, it, it's not realistic. Right, right. And it is uh, really um, forgetting um, how essential attunement to our interdependence is, right? As a, mm -hmm. as a means of reminding ourselves who we really are. I really love the example that you brought about, um, you know, the people who come to you and, uh, you know, are describing their interaction of, um, you know, noticing someone who is suffering in the street. So if I would apply that to my map, right, the very mm -hmm. outer rung of the map is all about when we're out and about navigating through the environment, society, and culture. So you're out, you, you, you witness this human being who is suffering 
right? And then it motivates you to go to the next level of the map. It motivated their behavior. It changed their relationship. It shifted Mm -hmm. their relationship with that person. It caused them to express agency in in that moment and to move towards that human, to speak to them and to offer them some sort of resource. Now, shifting to the next ring of the map, right, which is the physiological dimension where we're experiencing either vitality or disease, right? It's in this space of embodied awareness that they were able to really connect Mm -hmm. with, I suffer and therefore I can empathize that this other human being is suffering. But then, you know, and maybe there is some sort of, we could say, uh, potentially um, a health benefit there, right? To these feelings of interconnection that are arising. But then when we move to the next innermost rung of the map, right? Our identity awareness in that moment, their identity may have shifted to, well, I am a human being for whom altruism and compassion and empathy are important. Mm -hmm. That is a part of my identity. And then we can shift even further to where on, on, on the, on the innermost ring of the map, right? Now they have this, this, this memory of this moment that impacted their emotions and their feelings and their, their sensations and their thoughts about not only this human being, but perhaps about the situation of houselessness as well. They're carrying the memory of this moment in their bodies. And then when we get down to that center ring of pure awareness or the plane of possibility, right? What we would hope is that their practice is supporting them with dreaming and imagining a world anew where their community is the kind of community where another human being doesn't have to suffer in this way, right? Um, That would be the hope. That would be how the story that you just uh, invited Mm -hmm. into the space um, would play out on the map. Now, where I really am looking for collaboration and help because, you know, obviously this work is, is far too broad and too complex for me to do on my own. And what I'm excited about is, you know, just the other day I was um, on a panel conversation for um, a summit called the Resilience in the Anthropocene Summit Mm -hmm. being hosted through University of Wisconsin um, in partnership with Dr. Richie Davidson's lab, the Center for Healthy Minds. And it is a conference about climate change. And I was presenting about the systems-based awareness map because climate change, oh, do we ever need systems thinking Mm -hmm. to navigate this beast, right? And I was so heartened that so many different folks who were environmental scientists who are themselves doing like municipal mapping projects to really look at how climate change is impacting communities differently according to their identity, their race, their class, their you know, exposure to different environmental contaminants. And they saw my map and they said, hey, we should partner together. We should partner together. We should do a map making project together such that we can make these maps more widely available to the public in order to engender systems-based thinking that can empower us to do more and do what you said, Sharon, really consider well, what are the policy implications, right? What are the types of institutions that really need to be brought into these systems level conversations um, in a heartful way, in a way I hope that is oriented around loving awareness in order to, um, in order to do the work that needs to be done because there just is so much, there's just so much, you know? 
There is so much. And, you know, it just struck me now, like in the last example that I used when I talked about somebody saying having cancer diagnosis, mm-hmm. they might have a diagnosis of anxiety, you know, or depression. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, in addition to, um, you know, obviously race and gender and, uh, you know, sexual orientation and, and the kinds of things that, um, we are hopefully increasingly uh, becoming aware of um, in general, and certainly people have suffered for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that uh, one does feel like the other by virtue of this diagnosis and how it's related to. Yeah, you know how people uh, define it, what they expect of you, or what you um, fear they expect of you, and uh, so many. There's so much stigma. There's so much misunderstanding, and um, mm-hmm. it has a very big effect. Yeah, yeah, it um, it does. There and there is so much. You know, interestingly, I think, and 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 again, I'm going to preface this with saying this is my personal opinion, not necessarily a. a, a I'm not necessarily speaking as a scientist here, but as Sarah, I have witnessed so much stigma against healing. I have witnessed so much stigma uh, around the, like there's this idea that um, efforts to heal ourselves mean that we are weak, Mm -hmm. that we're out of control, that we don't have the right thinking that we didn't do the right thing, that we didn't have the right job or live in the right place. Or if we could just somehow, you know, mentally just, just grin and bear it, you know, and pull ourselves through um, that, that is the path to being okay. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and, 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 and and I've seen so much stigma against, um, you know, for instance, um, going to therapy, Mm-hmm. Um, so much um, of a of a of a narrative that um, a meaningful way of being human is about demonstrating your individualism, demonstrating your uh, brute strength and capacity to sort of will yourself out of a painful situation. And what I think this does is it further entrenches us in these habits, in these causes and conditions, as you're saying, um, that double down on our pain, Mm -hmm. that silence us, and that shut us down from building the kinds of safe and secure and open-hearted and intimate relationships that we need to have in order to peer within and uh, gently and compassionately investigate the source of our suffering. Uh, And so the mental health situation continues to worsen so long as uh, these stigmas and uh, these false stories about healing Mm -hmm. persist. I think a lot about resilience, of course. I think meditation practice is a practice of resilience and uh it always struck me as odd that for years um uh, foundations and and philanthropists were uh concentrating on resilient systems you know which are Mm -hmm. of course really important you want that you know uh dam to work in the river you know whatever (laughs) they really do that is essential that is essential you know but (laughs) But they weren't really talking about resilient people, you know. Yeah. Or resilient leaders. And I thought, well, it's not gonna work, you know, like um and now maybe there's a little bit more energy toward that. Um Yeah. I mean the word resilient can be kind of cliched. I was once uh, uh at, you know, one of those kind of fundraising gala dinners, you know, where yeah. an organization, a nonprofit will try to raise some money to help them do their good work throughout the year. And I was going to speak. And uh, before I was getting up on the stage, they just sort of randomly seated me at someone's table so that 
uh, I had a place to sit waiting and and you know I introduced myself said I was going to speak and and the hostess of the table said well I hope you're not going to talk about resilience because I already was at a resilience lunch today <laughs> and I thought oh dear that's exactly what I was going to talk about so, what else Uh-oh. can I call it I'm not really sure you know like, <laughs> right um, but you know I see so much in meditation training is really about resilience you know having your yeah. mind wandering being able to let go and begin again or um uh treating yourself uh more kindly you know yeah yeah with more loving awareness rather than like freaking out when your mind wanders and uh, blaming yourself endlessly and ending up sort of exhausted and overwhelmed yeah by all the blame and um so i'm not sure actually if it's known what happens in the brain when we're practicing resilience or if it even matters. Um, and just that, that kind of tool in general, you know, when you're, when you're looking at say social change, you know, how does it yeah. figure? Yeah. Um, I am not an expert in resilience. Um, you know, I'm, I'm aware that it's commonly defined as our, capacity to experience an adversity Mm -hmm. and to survive that adversity and to not only survive it intact, um, but to learn to thrive afterwards. Um, I'm also aware that, you know, there are some conversations out there that push back against the idea of resilience, um, particularly with marginalized populations, because some people Mm -hmm. would say, well, you know, it's, you know, why, why do I in this particular body always have to be the one Mm -hmm. to be resilient? I'm tired of being resilient. I just want to rest. I just want to chill. I just want to relax. I just want to, you know, really um, be held and to be soft and vulnerable and um, really given the opportunity to restore myself. And I understand that point also. I, I, I mm-hmm. see the merit of that argument. And so one of the things that I um, really love to look at, and again, I'm no expert in this field, um, but it is correlated with my research one of my dear friends is a scholar, uh, a Danish um, psychologist, clinical psychologist named Selma Quismuller. And she is uh, a Garrison fellow at the Garrison Institute along with mm-hmm. myself. And her research looks at a phenomenon called post-traumatic growth. To me, I think that this is a very rich area of exploration because it is this idea that like, yes, we need to cultivate resilience. We need to cultivate a capacity to, if you will, endure. Because sometimes there's going to be things that happen to us and our communities. And in the moment, the survival strategy, if you will, is to just get through it. Because it's hard. You know, I'm thinking about communities that are experiencing, um, you know, the, the, the aftermath of a natural disaster mm-hmm. um, or of war or of the refugee crisis, right? There are some situations that happen in life that, um, that can only be endured. They are that challenging, right? But post-traumatic growth is this idea that um, if we have an orientation towards the experience of trauma that we know we have the capacity to not only be resilient, but to be creative in how we are expressing ourselves and to um, to stay connected to our community um, and to, you know, really, really practice Uh, compassion. She has an incredible model around this, that a situation of trauma can be one in which we grow to become something different, something better than 
who and what we were prior to that experience. And I love that idea because, Mm -hmm. you know, there was a time in my life, Sharon, I'm a person who, you know, when I was growing up, I experienced a lot of chronic homelessness as well as um, physical and emotional abuse um, and discrimination. And before I found yoga and meditation, my identity was really bound, wrapped up very solidly in the suffering that I had experienced. Because I thought that who I was at my core was the sum total of my life experiences. And Mm -hmm. my life experiences, right, up until the age of um, 20 or 21, when I found these practices, had been full of pain and suffering of a really extraordinary degree. So I really thought that's who I was and that that was all that was destined for me was a life of trauma. Mm -hmm. It was very depressing. It was very painful. Um, So this idea of post-traumatic growth really resonates with me because now I can see that when I was able to not only ground myself in practices, but also in loving community. Chosen family has been extraordinarily important to me as well as my um, immediate family. That the traumas that I experienced in my life have really um, transformed my experience of myself to be so much richer um, such that I am so much more open-minded and open-hearted And I have this um, real curiosity and willingness to engage in the world that I don't think that I would have had if I hadn't um, been through those traumatic Mm -hmm. experiences and grown as a result of them. Of course, now I'm so curious. Like, (laughs) was it a person who basically um, mirrored back to you your own potential for change or just a set of circumstances? I should preface that by saying sometimes I really believe it is one person, which is why <laughs> it's so important we do that for others, you know? Yes. You think, well, this is nothing, you know, like this yeah. conversation or this <laughs> exchange, but sometimes that's it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, I will, I will say it was a confluence of um, many different factors. For for one thing, um, mentors have been very important to me in my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, I found mentors who cared about not just what I was able to contribute to the production of knowledge, but who I was on the inside, like Mm -hmm. every single aspect of me, I found those people in academia. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, for instance, Dan Siegel Mm -hmm. is a person who um, really has just shown me an extraordinary amount of um, compassion and loving kindness. And so I think for me, it was um, for one thing, finding communities of practice for one, at Spirit Rock. Spirit Rock, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. I really have to credit Spirit Rock and their um, retreat programs and the uh, mindfulness meditation teaching program Mm -hmm. that I was able to take with providing me with a safe and beautiful and grounded spiritual container with where I could really process my grief Mm-hmm. And it was natural. Suddenly, all that grief and that pain that I'd been carrying in my body, I had a place to express it where I didn't feel any of that stigma. And there were some extraordinary teachers there, like um, mm-hmm. Ann Cushman and Philip Moffat and Nollyway Alexander and Conda Mason. I mean, I could just go on down the line who. I learned so much from their embodied presence. Mm -hmm. And I was really able to carry that in my heart. So I would say, yes, community of practice, 
academic mentors, also um, being a mom. Mm-hmm. My my daughter uh, is Dahlia is one of my primary spiritual teachers because mm-hmm. you know I I had a daughter very young, very shortly after college, and one thing that um, that being a mother has shown me is that children are always marrying back to us whether or not we are being present with them. Um, and they, and she is just so extraordinarily loving. And mm. I would also um, say that there are many teachers who are um, maybe not necessarily uh, physically with us, but who I consider to be spirit guides. So, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, Martin Luther King, Thich Nhat mm-hmm. Han, Ram Dass, um, for instance. Um, I'm an avid reader. And, you know, when I take in their words into my spirit, um, I've experienced really profound levels of, of healing, um, including some of your books, Sharon. I'm going to throw that in oh, there. <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't throw that in there. So, you know, I, I think that there's just so many different extraordinary windows and doors of of beauty and of love um, to step into and and in which to be held. And I think I've just been very fortunate to encounter a lot of them. That's so lovely. And, you know, we're... So sadly, running out of time, there's so much more I want to talk to you about. But mm-hmm. I'm wondering if um, before we end, you might lead us in a short meditation. Absolutely. I would love to. And I deeply appreciate the invitation. So for those of you who are listening in this moment, and my deep gratitude to you all for your presence. Um, Wherever it is that you find yourselves, if you might come to a place that feels supportive of a moment of practice, some of you may be standing up or lying down or seated, and simply bringing the body to a place that feels compassionate and supportive, taking a moment. And perhaps as you're settling into this space, I'd love to invite you to take three deep breaths. And with each wonderful inhale and exhale, you might feel whatever area of the body is meeting with the earth, becoming a little bit more anchored, resting, settling. And here you might notice What quality of energy you've been holding in your awareness for the duration of this conversation? Allowing the breath to return to a natural pace and rhythm. And noticing. Are there certain areas of the body that are particularly vibrating with aliveness in this moment? Perhaps because you have been in listening mode, you may have any number of thoughts that are traveling through the mind. 
And that's okay. Noticing the thoughts. You might gently invite yourself to connect back with the breath. And see if each time you come back into awareness of the breath, bringing your attention to the rise and fall of the chest. Perhaps this has a subtle impact on the way that you're carrying your body. Here we might begin to notice if there are certain areas of the body that are holding on to some tension or tightness. We can offer ourselves some compassion here. Offering up any amount of relaxation, softening that is within our capacity here and now. And noticing if in this softening of the body that perhaps results in a shifting of our experience of the quality of the mind. Taking another deep breath or two here. Softening the muscles of the belly if we've been holding them tightly toward the spine. Allowing our shoulder muscles to gently relax. the muscles of the neck, softening along with the muscles of the jaw and the cheeks, the muscles behind the eyes and and the forehead and the scalp. If you'd like a little bit further support and anchoring for your practice, you may even place a hand gently over the heart or a hand over the belly. Reconnecting with the gentle in and out rhythm of the breath. And here, if you have any particular well wish, a wish of wellness for yourself, or perhaps for someone in your life, we might draw this feeling of well wishing into the heart. And we can even imagine for a moment that this feeling of well-wishing has a color. What is the color of wishing yourself or someone else well? And if no particular color comes to mind, that's okay too. But just for a moment, let's experiment and see if we can begin to shine a light of well-wishing out from the center of our hearts. 
It can be any color that you can imagine. In this moment, we are shining the light of well-wishing for ourselves and perhaps for others also, radiating this light of well-wishing into the world, allowing it to suffuse the space that is around you, And we'll take just a few moments to rest in the space that we are in and bear witness to ourselves shining this light of well-wishing. Noticing here how perhaps the quality of the energy that you are meeting with in your experience of the body might be a little bit different now than the quality of the energy that you brought with you to this practice. And if you have closed the eyes or lowered the eyes gently for this practice, you might begin to slowly and at your own pace and rhythm begin to open up the eyes. Maybe invite some movement, some wiggling of the fingers and the toes. uh, Gentle stretch of the arms over the head. Gently turning the head and the neck to look around you and take in this beautiful world. And I thank you for sharing your practice with us today. Thank you so much, Sarai. It was really beautiful. And thank you all for for listening. And um, may you be safe and happy, peaceful and free. Thank you. Mm, Thanks so much for having me, Sharon. It was a pleasure. Hey folks, if you'd like to learn more about Sarah, you can visit her website at mindheartcollective.com. That's M I N D H E A R T collective.com. To get a copy of Sharon's latest book, Real Life, or to register for her five day loving kindness challenge, head to sharonsalzberg.com. And before you go, please check out our mental health resources in today's show notes. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. And may you live with ease. Mm